Good morning. It is one of those rare Sabbaths when I can say from the pulpit, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and it is Christmas. And welcome, those of you who have decided to come to church, especially welcome you. Uh, I can't even, I can see a camera. And those of you who are at homes, um, no, you don't need to feel guilty. Um, but gather your family around and let us meditate on the story of Christmas today. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We are your children. And you know in a very special way what it means to be a father. As Jesus was born, who was God at the same time and man at the same time, but also helpless babe at the same time. You took the role of a father also. Today we want to meditate on that story, a beautiful gift you have given us in Jesus. So bless us, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. I entitled today's message as Christmas Beauty and the Challenge. It's based on a story recorded in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And here is the question I ask. So through the birth of Jesus, what is God teaching us about himself and about ourselves? So that's a big question. And I broke it down in three statements that I found in these two accounts. Number one, through the birth of Christ, God is reaching to everyone. God is reaching to everyone. Number two, God challenges everyone. And number three, God has an extra challenge for the faithful. You ready? I say God reaches to everyone, and in the original story, God reached to shepherds, to wise men, religious leaders, and the national leaders. And you could say that they were representatives of us all. He literally reached to everyone. Now you can ask a question, how do we know that God reached to shepherds? Well, it's really simple. And you know that the choir of angels, first initially one angel, and then the choir of angels came to them, and you know that this is a miracle. This just does not happen every day. When was it the last time an angel sang to you? I can't see any hand. But this happened. In the original story of Christmas, this happened. So we know that God, we know that God was reaching to simple shepherds. Now, how do we know that God was reaching to wise men? Well, the answer is very simple. And you will see why I'm asking these simple questions. Well, we know because the star, this star was brighter than any other and was leading these foreigners to come to Jerusalem and then to come to Bethlehem. And this does not also happen every day. Original Christmas story is the story of a miracle of God in a miraculous way reaching out to people to groups of people and individuals. Now, this is a little harder question. How do we know that God was reaching to leaders? How do we know that God was reaching to Herod and the political establishment of that time and also religious leaders? How do we know? Here is sub-question to this one. Why was it 
that God was not leading wise men directly to Bethlehem. Because he could have. Straight from that foreign land to Bethlehem. But instead, this star that was shining bright kind of stopped above Jerusalem. And this is where the wise men stopped. And they went to the palace. Because that's where king should be. Believing that that's where they would find the Messiah. But no. God was going to reach to the political establishment of the time. As well as the religious leaders. So yes. God was reaching uneducated, poor, non-influential, despised shepherds. He came to them. And he even said, to you on this day, the Savior was born. But then he was reaching intellectuals of that time. Influential, non-Jewish. But then, he was reaching powerful, rich, and his own people. So can you see how the reach is wide? Non-Jews, Jews. Everyone. Non-intellectual, ignorant, poor, despised. And at the same time, the cream of intellectual world at that time. Non-Jewish, but Jewish. Power brokers, religious leaders, the, those who, sh who shape the faith of others. The reach of God was very wide. I want you to see something very clear. And that is that our status, our occupation, whether you are rich or not, whether you are intellectual or not, it does not disqualify you from the reach of heaven. Whether you are shepherd, wise man, politician, prostitute, tax man, None of these disqualify you from the reach of heaven. But by the same token, none of these qualify you from the reach of heaven. In other words, if what we do, if the role that we have if the status that we acquire does not qualify us, what then qualifies us for heaven's favor? What makes shepherds, wise men, leaders, taxmen, prostitutes, teachers, fathers, mothers, children special in God's eyes? If it is not what we do, if it is not what we acquire, if it is not to what group of people we belong, what is it then? I can only think of two things, and that is our identity, which is that you and I are children of God. You and I are made in the image of God for the purpose that God of heaven, who made us in his, in his image, has a special loving relationship with us. That's what qualifies us for the favor in the eyes of God. That's one, but not the only one. The only other thing I can think of is our need. Every human being is in need of the Savior God because every single one of us is a sinner. That's what qualifies you 
for the reach and the favor of heaven. God's reach is global, but I would say to you it is also very, very specific. Christmas story tells us that we are all precious and special to God, worthy of His love and of His salvation. How good is that? Christmas story also is very specific as it has specific challenges that God has towards every single one of us as well as the groups of people. God has a challenge for shepherds for wise men and for leaders. While his reach is wide, his challenge is very specific. What is it specifically that God is reaching or challenging these groups of people that he came to? I want us to look at the story as God reaches to shepherds. Let's remind ourselves as we read. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord just shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. What was the challenge? To shepherds. Yes, God was reaching to them, but at the same time, God was challenging them. I want you to see something that you probably already know, and that is that shepherds were the lowliest of the lowly, the least influential in the society they were part of, probably the poorest of the poor. Not only that the society told them to be so, but that's what they believed about themselves. We are nobodies. We are not worthy. We are sinful. This is too good to be true. This is not what they heard from people around them. This is what they believed about themselves. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a person who is beating upon himself or herself? And whatever you say and whatever you do, they kept, keep doing that. 
I am nobody, I'm not worthy, I have nothing. And there's just this prevailing inner attitude. And whatever you say, whatever you do, they keep beating upon themselves. Have you met those people? And all their lives, simple shepherds were told in no uncertain term by the surrounding culture and the surrounding people that they are nobodies, that they are not worthy, that they are sinners. They were told and they believed it. Did you realize that to these types of people, God prepares a concept? Did you see that? God organizes a concept. And the very first Christmas song was performed to these simple people. Why? Heaven does not perform a concert for wise men or for leaders. Why not? Why not? Heaven is performing a concert to people who say, I am not good enough, I am not worthy, I am nobody. Let me ask you a question. Does it happen to you as it happens to me that in the morning when you wake up, there is a song turning in your head? Anybody? Anybody here? And you have no idea where it came from. Just suddenly, radio kicks in. And there is this song going on. Where did it come from? It just happens. Or maybe a Bible text. Can I suggest to you, that, that from that day on, when, when these simple shepherds listened to this choir of angels performing an incredible concert for them, that every single morning as they woke up and they were tempted to think, I am nobody, I am worthless, I am a sinner, This song performed on the hills of Bethlehem started to play. And what was the song saying? You're special. You're worthy. Yes, you're a sinner, but I give you a savior. I love you. It is not easy to break the mentality of a shepherd that he is nobody. It's not easy. Try to do it with the person who is beating on herself or on himself, and you will see how hard. But God knows how to short-circuit what happens here in your mind and in my mind. From that time on, deeply etched in the soul of these simple shepherds will be God's love song. Do you see that? It was a challenge, but it was real. God was saying, I love you. Can you see that this was by design? God did not perform a concert for wise men, did he? God did not perform a concert for religious leaders, did he? But he did for these simple people. Shepherd, shepherds needed this heaven's assurance that they are special, that they are loved, that they are worthy, even though they felt as nobodies. Heaven in the birth of Jesus speaks to us ordinary ones and he says, you're special. Do you believe that? 
Sergio, you are special. You're worthy. God says, I love you. I love you. By design, God not only had a special challenge for shepherds, he had a very special and specific challenge for the wise man. Let's read the story. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. When they're coming to the house, a stable, they saw a child, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You see, the problem the shepherds had, we could say, was one of insignificance syndrome. What do you think the challenge the wise man had? Could it be opposite? Do you think that wise men knew that they were wise men? Of course they did. They had a special status in the country they belonged. They knew that they were men of influence. So God confronted them when they came to Bethlehem with simple Jewish parents. They might have thought that they were the nobility. But no. This king they were so looking forward to see was of an ordinary birth of simple Jewish parents. They were confronted with the fact that this king, they were so looking forward to see and give him these expensive, expensive presents. He was born in a stable. They were confronted with the fact that this king they were looking forward to meet was born in a manger bed. They were confronted with the order unbecoming of King's presence. Why? Why was God in His design that these, when He, when God decided that He was going to lead these special people? with this glorious star that was leading them all the way, contrasted this, this star of Bethlehem with a simple baby in a stable, on a manger bed, with his simple Jewish parents. How confronting was that for these people? God did that by design so differently than he treated the shepherds. No concert for them. Let's go a little deeper. If you are a manager, then you know that you are a manager. If that's what you do. And you know what? Being a manager can get into your head. 
and you can potentially mistreat people. Let's go further. If you are president, then you know that you are president. And being a president get, can get into your head. If you're an elder, you know that you're an elder, and being an elder can get into your head more than it should. If you have a higher position than somebody else, then you know that you have a higher position, and it can get into your head more than it should. If you are a pastor, then you know that you are a pastor, and it can get into your head more than it should. And if you are a wise man, and you know that you are a wise man, then it can get into your head more than it should. And therefore, God wants you to meet simple Jewish parents in a stable, in a stable with a baby who is a king on a manger bed, and God will not perform a concert for you. What is the challenge? What is the challenge? Here is a challenge. Although Jesus, a little baby, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he's still humble. How does this work? How can a King of kings and Lord of Lords, be very comfortable, very comfortable to lie in a manger among animals and be perfectly fine with that. How is that possible? The height of his glory is matched by the lowliness of his humility. How do you match the reality that God is so glorious, yet he is so humble? The only way that you can match the irreconcilable is that he is immensely loving. Only somebody who loves immensely is also humble immensely. That's the story of Christmas. That's a challenge for wise men. The challenge for wise men, the challenge for you and me, is to be humble. And the way you know that you are humble is the more you love and show that love towards others and the more you serve. You see, God is very wide in his reach on a Christmas day. He reaches everyone. But he is very specific in the way he challenges those that he comes to. He says, I will perform a concert for shepherds, but I will give, I will confront the wise man with the order of a stable, with the simple parents of the Messiah, the King, so that they know that King above, so high, in essence, is humble King. Because he's loving. That's another challenge. So the greater our position, the greater should be our humility. Because it reflects the love of God. So the message is one of humility and love. And la lastly, the third challenge of Christmas. Here is that part of a story. When King Herod heard that he was disturbed, uh, the, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, 
and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Wise men, come to the palace. And there are three groups of people in palace. Wise men, religious leaders, and the King Herod, and the political establishment. And now these leaders are listening to the authority of the Bible and the authority of the one that the Bible in the book of Micah mentions, and that is the Messiah himself. And, the, and that text is saying that he is the ruler. Authority of the word, mentioning the authority of the Messiah, is addressing religious authority and political authority. And he's basically saying, submit. What is the challenge? For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What is the challenge? You would know that shepherd provides, shepherd protects, and shepherd leads. It's a very specific challenge that God gives on that day that Christmas Day to the leadership, political, and religious is this. Herod, do you provide for people or is it all about you? You Pharisees and Sadducees, do you provide spiritually for people Herod, do you protect people? Sadducees and Pharisees, do you protect spiritually people? Do you lead people? Specific challenge for the leadership. Later on, Jesus would say, I am a good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. I will provide. I protect. I lead. That's another one. This is the message of Christmas too. If you are in a position of leadership, that's a challenge that God gives you. Do you to provide? Do you protect? Do you lead? Do you give yourself to others? Do you give yourself to others? If you are in any leadership position, do you give yourself in a loving service to others? That was very specific message of Christmas. It is message to our political leaders today. It is message to all of us who are in leadership position. And finally, God has extra challenge for the faithful. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother and departed to Egypt, and remained there until death, or until the death of Herod. You see, the story of Christmas is this. If you embrace Jesus... You invite the wrath of devil. 
If you embrace Jesus, you invite the wrath of devil and you pay the price. There are no two ways about it. Joseph and Mary had to flee and they became refugees. When Jesus came, every single life was turned upside down. Herod's life was turned upside down. Pharisees and Sadducees started scratching their head. Their lives were turned upside down. Mary's life was turned upside down. Joseph's life was turned upside down. When God comes, he hits hornet's nest or devil's kingdom. And he does that on purpose. And eventually, he himself was going to pay the price and his people are going to pay the price. You see, the life of anyone who embraces Jesus, that's what Christmas is. To receive the gift, you will invoke the wrath of a devil. And at the same time, your life will not be boring. It will be purposeful and it will be meaningful. The life that we live in, especially now, as we are waiting for the second appearing of Jesus, is exactly like that. It's not boring. It is meaningful and purposeful. But we will pay the price. Let me read to you. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child over who, uh, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make a war in the re uh, on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon became furious. Oh, I've already read that, but I have obviously two slides. And here is another one. Here is the call of the, for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and have their faith in Jesus. You know what? Whenever we read this last text, where's our typical emphasis? Those who keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. Isn't that where our emphasis is? How about having an emphasis on the first part also? Which says that we are to have endurance. We are not told about Mary and Joseph in Egypt how they had to endure as refugees and be at the mercy of people who probably had to help them and they had to endure that kind of life when God comes and the hornet's nest of devil's kingdom is rattled. We pay the price. An endurance in what is being asked. The first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus are characterized by the fury of devil and persecution of saints on one hand and also by the endurance of the saints. And let me finish by saying, the suffering of Jesus on the cross, his glorious resurrection, makes endurance and the patience of saints possible as we wait for his second 
at this time a glorious return. That's the story of Christmas as I see it. <clears throat> God has a wide reach. And through shepherds, through wise men, through political and religious leaders who are our representatives, he reaches absolutely to everyone. Uneducated, uninfluential, poor, despised, rejected. Intellectuals, non-Jewish, thought shapers, powerful, power brokers, Jews. Everyone is involved. God has a wide reach because he doesn't care who you are in terms of your calling. But he cares who you are because you are his child and you are a sinner who needs a savior. But this same God has a very specific challenge for you and for me. He has a, ch a challenge for you if you are a leader. He has a challenge for you if you are just a simple person. He has a challenge for you if you are in a position of an influence. And he has a challenge for us as the faithful ones. And he tells us that if we are part of his kingdom, the things will not be easy. But endurance and patience and Emmanuel who is God with us will see us through. So may God bless you and Merry Christmas.